In the last four episodes of our title deals series, we've delved into some of Kenya's pressing land issues, from illegal evictions and demolitions to land disputes that seem to have no end. You have 30 random looking people walking into your house um, all over the place and then you can see them with crowbars and pangas. How intimidated and threatened are you going to feel? Since 1971, We've named names and brought you face to face with individuals attempting to unlawfully strip others of their rightful land and showed you the lens some go to in the pursuit of land. They develop their own title. I would like to know how. I think eh, we are not going to speak in a word. And we are not going to speak anything. Because I know we, don't, we cannot see over here. We can see other few men from, He's coming. from, from, from foreigners country. I don't know. This is more Kenya. No problem. The person behind all these things is one Hassan Ibrahim Isaac. In our final episode, we look into the areas that need attention and ask, where does accountability come into play? Is there a way forward for land ownership in Kenya? It's a commonly held belief that corruption starts at the top and trickles down. In Kenya, this systemic issue has entrenched origins that run deep. According to the Lancaster House agreements, the land was supposed to be bought from the white settlers. And the Kenya government in 1964-1965, through the British Ministry of Overseas Development, advanced the loans to the Kenya government to be able to buy the land from the white settlers. A lot of land was bought. But I'm saying that um, that land did not actually go to the poor people. It went to people who are in the new Kenyan civil service. So the dispensation was that um, black people would get land. But that is not what happened because the people on the ground did not actually... Uh, the, the ones who mattered, the ones who had the need, are not the ones who are served by that kind of system. The relationship between land matters and corruption, evidently influenced by the first Kenyan government, prompts us to not only scrutinize the historical roots of these injustices, but also to question why they continue today. When you are doing it together, we are together. And when we are doing the wrong things, we are together. But um, I, if you are found, it means you are doing it badly. You should not do it badly. When you are a clever person, just to make sure that you eat when you are quiet. Because if you are quiet, you eat forever. The impact of the statement by Kenyatta is what we have today. Kenya has become unwieldy. Kenya has become more hungry. Kenya has become more antagonized as a country. After the colonial period, the situation has never changed. The state has, is actually the landlord because the state is now the one which controls how people access land. Even if it's your own private land, uh, the principle land ownership has never changed to the point that there is the landlord who controls uh, how people access their land, whether private land, whether public land, uh, whether communal land. It's sad that the people who have done this go home, they look at their children, they look at their wives, and they live a life of normality and think that it's okay to steal from someone else. The future doesn't really look very bright. It doesn't look very bright until something in the land's office is sorted out. Because how, are, how is anyone else going to invest in anything? Any Kenyan looks at a piece of little land where you want to retire or something that you can just save up to buy or that. But then this way, what's the point of spending your life just trying to fight for what you already belongs to you? Why should this injustice be continuing in our nation 
Why should this be done in our nation? Rats, people are being, their rats are being taken. Houses are being taken. Why would that roadiness continue? Why are they not protecting us? That is what I expect. I expect protection and I expect security. I expect that when I'm in need of the, our leaders, they are available. If I am, I am in need of help from the authority, authority would be coming to help me. And that is the work we elect them to do, to keep our constitution. But is it being kept? It is not being kept. I'm not discouraged by the government. I'm discouraged by the individuals who sit in different positions of influence. It is really a sad, a sad state of affairs that in this year, 2023, we are still talking about land grabbing in Kenya. I can imagine if for us it's difficult right now. What about in the next generation? You're talking about a claim to owning land. For that claim to work, you need to ensure, for example, you have a title document to that land. And that title ought to have been acquired through a process which is both legal, which is both regular and fair. You cannot claim to have a right because you have a title when the process through which that title you know, was obtained was not legal, was not regular, was not fair. We are having a situation where people have illegally occupied, whether it is public land, community land, or private land, and nothing has been done to them. They continue to occupy those spaces. People have illegally um, en enforced the eviction of people from their own land, which they rightfully own, uh, but then nothing happens. There's no accountability, there's no action, there's no justice that is seen for people who have been affected you know, by land grabbing. And because of that, you know, we give the, the, the land grabbers, you know, the courage, you know, the audacity to continue to perpetrate such actions. Having explored various cases, it's clear that the fight for land in Kenya goes beyond legal disputes. It signifies a challenge to a deeply ingrained system a battle against an existing status quo that appears to perpetuate not only the loss of land, but also the loss of dreams, homes and ownership rights. The 2010 constitution, in fact, there's a huge uh, chapter relating to land matters, you know, which governs the public interest and uh, also the private interest in land. And uh, it was very deliberate because of the history we've had on uh, land disputes. But, uh, in the implementation of the constitution, we see that the disputes are still there to a large extent. And uh, in my view, it is not that the constitution is not elaborate enough. It is because the implementers are not playing their role correctly. Masharian Jeru is the current vice chair of the Judicial Service Commission, where he deputizes the chief justice and serves as a commissioner. The biggest failure actually emanates from land office officials and the National Land Commission. Because these are the people who you'd say are the repository of the records. They are the people who are supposed to ensure the sanctity of the titles is uh, respected and protected, so to speak. But now again, when you have rogue officials who develop a personal interests and they become part, on, part and parcel of the fraudulent transactions, uh, then that jeopardizes, you know, the public interest. It also jeopardizes a uh, private interest. I have seen situations whereby two or three or four people are claiming ownership of the land, and they all have titles. And when you look at these titles, they've been signed by land officials. Th that's not possible because it is possible to go back to the history of a land, uh, any subject land, by just you know digging into the survey records, the correspondence file and land office. So it's not possible. It can only be fraud. The presence of conflicting land claims, often backed by seemingly valid titles and official approvals from the Ministry of Lands, give rise to concerns regarding the integrity of land documentation processes in Kenya. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that, that we have had is that uh, the issue about the manual records. 
because you understand from when you keep manual things in, in uh, manually, it relies really in terms of your memory, it relies really on whether you are updating those records and so on and so forth. And um, it so happens that even when somebody wants to do some due diligence on a piece of land, if that information is not properly stored, uh, then it becomes a bit of a challenge. We cannot say that 100% joy that there are no documents that find our, their way into our registry. Because uh, when you work in manual records, it is easier to lose and to have those kind of documents. That's why we have uh, rigorously engaged on the issue of digitization, so that we move from the manual records to the digital records. Because the beauty in this is that uh, when you already digitize your record, anytime somebody is going to log in even to change a record, there will be a, thing, a footprint left in that system. It will tell you who came in and who came in this time, it did one, two, three. But in a manual system, sometimes it's difficult to say who moved that file, who removed. Sometimes you get those kind of complications. This system will not allow you to transact if you're not a registered user. So the first thing you do when you get on the platform is to register. How long has this taken to put together? To build this platform and to do the data cleaning, it's been three years. We started the project in February of 2018. So basically, you've broken the cartels. You're breaking them, or you've broken them. We intend to. That, that's tough. Because with this system, yeah. you don't need a middleman. Adi Sasa is a national digital land information management system developed by the Ministry of Lands. It was officially launched on 27th April 2021. You see now, as you zoom close, it will even tell you the street. It will tell you so that you will know the land we are looking for. You see where it is coming. So you will easily know this land is Haiko Kwa Barabara, Haiko Kwa Forest, Haiko Kwa Liva, Mutoni Wapi. You are able to see and be able to see, yes, land here in Irikuwa, nina nunu ama nina diri nayo, iko maali furani. This platform is said to have the capacity to provide Kenyans with access to credible, reliable and efficient land and land-based services. A decision aimed at curbing corruption and enhancing the security of land records in Kenya. The beauty about this system is that for the first time, we were able to relate the land with the ground. Currently, we have done digitization in Nairobi, and you could see that the records from all the departments were talking. If you check a parcel, that parcel does not exist in a vacuum. It must be where it is situated on the ground. So that location was being captured into the system. Now with the cadaster, it gives you to the specific position of where that parcel is on the ground. And I'll tell you this, this for me is uh, what will cure our land issues. Uh, we have registered, uh, you will be shocked, over 21,000 users in the country. And we have also registered foreigners. I, in terms of services, we have an, almost all our services on the platform. And this will go on. We are done in Nairobi. His Excellency is very specific that before the end of his term, we must have covered the whole of Kenya. Adi Sasa is believed to have the potential to revolutionize land transactions in Kenya, making them more secure, efficient and accessible to everyone. However, the platform's success hinges on a couple of factors. Among them is its effective implementation and the government's ability to tackle challenges and limitations within the system. What you get, you give the system is what it will give you. You, you do not expect a system to be to many buyer. So we had to check our, as I told you about the departments, if it is a parcel, we had to check it across all the departments. Was there a plan for this property? Was it surveyed? Was there maybe a rotiment? Then the title was issued. Who was issued the title? All this information, we were making sure they speak to each other. You go to the land ministry, you get to search the property, and you know this land belongs to so-and-so. 
you have the confidence because it's the government prescribed way of verification. So you can imagine how frustrating it is once you've gone through it, then somebody from somewhere comes and say, wait a minute, no, this is my property. I got confirmation from the Adisasa side, uh, the one that does digital records. And even we did a search of our own land and it showed that the land actually belongs to Everready Security Guards Company Limited. But now you find out in another department of the lands, the land, the ministry, the department of survey, that there is where all these things started from. How can you have an, of, an official of the Ministry of Land, uh, a registrar of lands, writing a letter saying that the land actually belongs to us? And then one week later or two weeks later, comes up with another letter saying that the land belongs to somebody else. People like this to me are people who should be in jail because you're playing around with people's lives. The land office just said the files disappeared. How does a file that is in your custody get legs and walk out of the offices. Anyone who is responsible, there has to be a custodian of the file. You know, we give all this in good faith. When they change the names from uh, my father-in-law's name to these two uh, individuals' names, it has to be a person who's actually put it. And whilst I was uh, at the county, they, they mentioned that there are 60 files missing. Does that mean there are 60 more people waiting for the same fate? You know it's not good for you to come to government. Who are the custodian of that information? Who you have entrusted to keep your information? Then they tell you, sorry, we can't get your information. Sorry, we don't know where the information went. Uh, I, I think this is what we want to run away because in the manual space, it is easier to have that done. These are some of the things that we were building on so that if something is found in that system and we realize the information is bad, then we don't need to be guessing. We will just ask each other, tell us how this information ran it to your desk and you placed it into the system. Tell us whether you verified. You know now we will be dealing with a specific person. And I think because of this now, even our officers know that the stakes are high. The ethical conduct of key professionals such as government officials, lawyers, surveyors and others entrusted with upholding the land administration system is paramount for the integrity of land ownership rights in Kenya. Nevertheless, their engagement in impunity not only compromises their responsibilities but also erodes the foundations of a fair and just land management system. One of the things that we have been pushing for across the public sector is the ethical leadership, you know, as per Chapter 6 of the Constitution, that selection or election to public office should be on the basis of personal integrity. That's well articulated in Article 73 2B of our Constitution under Chapter 6. Um, but that's not happening. We really need to drive for people who are ethical and demonstrate other values as articulated in Article 10 of our Constitution, Article 10 on national values and principles or principles of governance, accountability, good governance, uh, transparency, patriotism, you know, those are things that are really, really important uh, that should drive anyone who's seated in public office. Uh, besides just getting people who have a track record of integrity, I think a good cure is building transparency. And that's what the blockchain technology really um, has been applied in many countries, is all, all about. Where if you own a piece of land, and you sell it to me, that information is replicated in all the databases. Blockchain makes sure that that transaction, when it's done, the banks that have databases, the Ministry of Lands, the government that has data, all those databases are notified and updated. People only think of blockchain in terms of Bitcoin and such, but I think the most, uh, probably one of the best uses of blockchain should be in the real estate industry, not just for uh, administration perspectives, but even it allows the processes, the commercial process, to go much faster. As efforts to implement digital solutions such as Adisasa progress, doubts about the reliability of land records continue. However, in the broader context of safeguarding tenure security and land ownership rights in Kenya, the ministry is just one piece of the puzzle. The challenges faced by landowners extend beyond a single institution. Policemen in Kenya 
have been bought and they have been corrupt such that they are just like uh, machines that are told go and do that and they do because when you come to a place like a premises you have a brain to listen why can't you look at the case and say that ah let's go back let's go back and visit this thing before we implement it askari walikuwa natumwa usiku wanakuja wanabomoa nyumba setu bila oda bila kutoda na wakitushika wanatupeleka kotini ya hururu kama mara 20 bila sababu sikuwa nalala kwa chaba nilikuwa nalala kwa msito chini nilikuwa nalala kwa miti na usiku hiyo kila kisiku walikuwa nakuja wanafamia nyumba wanaharibu wanachukua wengine wanawapeleka ya hururu hakuna kesi ilikuwa inaendelea on the day when we called police from three different police stations from Parkland Spring Valley and Gigiri not one police responded police only comes in on the issue of land when there is element of criminality that's the time we, we normally chip in if there are no element of criminality then we normally leave it to the entity that are mandated to deal with the issue of land however there are some instances where when we found the conflicts of a particular land might jeopardize the peace of the area or the order where the the law can be jeopardized or, or the, the the peace can be disturbed those are instances when we can come in led by figures like Omar the police play a critical role in upholding law and order yet Mashari's oversight reveals a more troubling aspect the collaboration between some police officers and fraudsters the kind of expertise that the CID have would easily be able to resolve the issues of uh, investigations to the extent that uh, if there's a dispute by two or three people over who is the rightful owner they can do a forensic analysis that goes back to determining even the history of the land and indicate who is the rightful owner and provide that evidence so that, that evidence can ensure that firstly the culprit is prosecuted when fraudsters consistently engage in fraud and no and there are no consequences they become emboldened they become emboldened and that's why you find that uh, you find some characters who are known they are known by the police and these fraudsters consistently you find that the same people who, even when it comes to the land litigation in court you see the same same names so the CID know them but why does that happen because some of the CID officials have also become part of that cartel they help these fraudsters and uh, even sometimes when they know that they they tamper with the correct evidence the correct information that is supposed to be used to assist the courts or even the rightful owners to get their land when it's when they are being dispossessed we have these people who run around masquerading we know the, some of them again the problem joy you know there are people who have money uh, and unfortunately that is the problem which uh, makes things complicated in this uh, you might even get to certain extent extent an officer want to take an action then you will get calls threats so you find even the officer my registrar is fearing for his life you'll be surprised uh, that we had land belonging to a police station actually grabbed and we had to recover that property back for the police we had law courts where land belonging to a court actually adjusted to the is an extension of the existing court where we had to recover and take it back to the judiciary so these people who grab this property are so daring if one can dare grab land that belongs to a police station it's actually an extension of the police station what what can they not do really In the fight against corruption and land grabbing in Kenya, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission takes a pivotal role. In 2022, the EACC successfully recovered and returned to the government 39 title deeds for public property valued at 5.2 billion shillings. These properties, grabbed by private developers in collusion with public officials, belonged to various public institutions and county governments. But as government properties including police stations become targets for land grabbers how can the rights of ordinary citizens be adequately shielded from such bold attempts so there's an element where people are feeling like they'll take the law upon their hands or you decide to take action so if guns are victory use guns and there's there's a very good argument for that 
if the government cannot protect you, then who, who can you pay to protect you? I'm not discouraged by the government. I'm discouraged by the individuals who sit in different positions of influence. The policemen who are in those uh, police stations, the DCI agents who are in those stations who are trying to investigate this case. If we can have a bit of diligence, we can, we can, we can be sure that we get the correct, uh, the correct people in and the wrong people out. Who saves the Kenyan ordinary people is A, an understanding by our political elites and the senior political elites in this country, talking all the way from uh, even the president himself and his, the executive, committing themselves to the rule of law and judiciary picking it up, the courts picking it up and establishing, condi establishing conditions under which the rule of law becomes the, the key instrument to govern disputes, uh, arbitration of disputes, um, to govern um, uh, administration of land, among others. Anybody who goes against, I mean, uh, contravenes the existing law, of course will face the consequences. We don't only recover, but where we find that, uh, you know, lands officials or even the people who claim to own the land participated in the illegal acquisition, we also charge them in court. And uh, I can tell you we have cases against the previous commissioners of lands, very many cases scattered all over the country. One thing that I can tell you for a fact is if we go into a matter, we go to it to finality. And there is no, there, there is no uh, matter that has ever been too hot for us. The Constitution expects us to be independent. The law expects us to be independent. And the one thing that this Commission has done over time is to guard that independence. At no time in my recollection have we yielded to powers, uh, be they whoever they are, to you know, either to stop us from doing something or to compel us to do something. So that one I can tell you for a fact that we, once we are satisfied that we have a case here, we go for it to the finality. The journey in pursuit of justice is often marked by a gradual progression through the legal system known for its notably slow pace. Nevertheless, for many, this endeavor proves to be an enduring trial draining them of both hope and will. Something that needs to be changed in Kenya is how long our court cases last. You know, you can't be going on year after year, just going through the same old court cases. You know, one side puts in all these delaying tactics and then by the time you get a court hearing, it's six weeks, two months, three months. I mean, come on. There are magistrates and judges who postpone cases intentionally. Because I wonder, like our case, these guys went to court and in three weeks were given. We go to court, we are told that the judge cannot hear our case for now, he postpones it for four months. The next time we go to court, the judge is not available, another judge comes in. You see, at the end of the day, in as much as a lot of times people blame the judiciary and the accusations are leveled against them, remember, as I said, it is the failure by these other two institutions that lead to litigation. If those clean up of the records and of course the people themselves in the land's office and also the land fraud unit within the CID they are to do the right thing, those two institutions can ensure that the sanctity of the title is protected without even people having to go to court. Because it is the failure of these two areas that lead now to people seeking justice from the courts. Natural for us, of course, to expect justice and also to expect that uh, if you buy land, your land will not be taken away. This is a legitimate expectation that uh, 
you know, the state, and the state is us. Uh, we, we, in the judiciary, in the lands office, in the Ministry of Environment, will ensure that we safely um, ensure that uh, people can be protected. The Environment and Land Court, ELC, was established by the 2010 Constitution to determine all disputes relating to land and environment in Kenya. Prior to its establishment, these disputes fell under the jurisdiction of either the High Court or the Land Dispute Tribunal. While the ELC initially brought confidence in resolving land issues, a decade later, challenges, particularly delays, continue to impact its effectiveness. It took them four days to demolish my house. And is it going to take me four years or 40 years to get justice? No, that, it, it can't work like that. I can say this without fear of contradiction because we won the case, the first allowed, and they were barred from ever entering to the land. But up to date, they have their goons in our matrimonial home where they don't allow us to go and continue doing farming and so that we can enjoy the whole land. I've uh, gone to, from one office to the other to show that, but most of them they say that their hearts are tied. So I feel very bad when uh, the first generation, second, third and fourth, they will always sink more to poverty, to destitute, because some whereites have taken that and they are untouchable. I don't remember a time in the history of this country that there has been such proactive approach than now. Because what has happened is that uh, there's a huge increase in the number of uh, environment and land court judges. There has been recruitment, a massive recruitment of these judges uh, to an extent whereby almost every now county, uh, almost not all, but almost all of them, have an environment and land court judge. This is primarily to address the issue you've raised about uh, delay in the concluding matters. Because um, um, the vision of the Chief Justice, which is on uh, social transformation through access to justice, is to ensure that everybody can access justice but also in an expedient way to expedite matters uh, without, of course, compromising uh, the quality. Despite the commitment expressed by Masharia, our investigations have revealed concerns related to the judiciary. These include allegations of corruption, instances of incompetence, and the issuance of court orders that don't adhere to due process, among other issues, hindering the access to justice. Being the judge who is supposed to adjudicate between two sides that are fighting over something was, is the first person that I blame himself. Because we were not served even to appear in court. Nobody came and said, here's your summons to appear in court. So nobody even went to say anything on our side. So he made a one-sided decision that he should not have made. The cartels have discovered they know how to shop for the particular ju judge or much to get a court order from. And there's even cases where a court clerk signs a court order and you get evicted. And the cartels move very, very fast. So they go, they evict you, and then when they evict you and defense, they go back to court and actually pray for status quo. Status quo means who is actually occupying the land. So already, already the land grub is occupying your land. And they, are, and they are known people actually. Even the judges who do these things and much is actually known. Having considered all the evidence and following the tribunal's findings that allegations one, two, three, four, five, and six have been proved, we unanimously find that the judge's conduct was in breach of the Judicial Service Code of Conduct and Ethics regulations. On 7th February 2023, President William Ruto received the findings of a tribunal led by Lady Justice Mombin Kuge investigating the conduct of suspended High Court Judge Said Juma Shitembwe. He was suspended in 2022 by the former President Uhuru Kenyatta over gross misconduct. This included obtaining a vested interest in a land involving a case he was presiding over in Malindi. The tribunal revealed Shitembo's improper behavior in the impeachment case against then-Governor Mike Sonko involving financial transactions where the judge sought his share in dollars and dirhams. The extensive report also included serious allegations of bribery against two unnamed judges in Mombasa, Malindi and Nairobi. We therefore recommend to Your Excellency 
that the Honorable Mr. Justice Said Jumachi Tembwe be removed from office, from the office of judge of the High Court. This is yet another step as a country that we are building on the firm foundation of the rule of law, uh, sticking to the dictates of uh, what our constitution and the law provides in dealing with whatever uh, issues that arise in our society. Your presentation of this uh, report, I think, brings to the end your responsibility. And uh, myself and others will take it up from there and also discharge our responsibility accordingly. If this report holds true, it exposes a disturbing reality where justice appears to be available to the highest bidder, resembling a marketplace rather than a pillar of justice. These findings beg a larger question. Could Shitembwe be just a single example of a more widespread issue? Who else is involved in this troubling pattern? And how prevalent is this trade of justice within the system? Our structure is, is defined in a manner that decision independence of a judge and a judicial officer to protect also the independence is such that JSC has no role to play. Where we come in is if you have evidence that this misconduct on the part of that judge or judicial officer. Sometimes they make a right decision, sometimes they, they make a wrong decision. Now, that is not to say that uh, sometimes you not have an uh, errant you know, judge or errant a judicial officer. And it's in the public domain that judges have been removed as are arising from um, you know, action by a judicial service commission. Same thing also with magistrates. We've removed them. Land grabbing has caused substantial disruptions in land management and administration in Kenya. Despite policy recommendations, the government's inadequate intervention has created an environment conducive to the unlawful seizure of private, communal and public land. I think uh, during the, the uh, Third Republic uh, under uh, Mwai Kibaki, that's when we began realizing that this was, a, was becoming a serious problem. If you remember, um, a bit of it was mentioned by, because under the Moi uh, and Moi, we had the Njonjo Commission, which began to talk about some of the challenges that Kenya was facing, lack of policy, lack of uh, legislation, appropriate legislation, uh, institutions that needed to be reformed. During the Kanu era, amid political dissent, the ruling elite unlawfully allocated public land to gain support. In 2003, the Ndongo Commission, appointed by the NAG government, probed into these irregular land allocations, aiming to recommend measures for restitution. Despite evolving land policies and various efforts, including the establishment of commissions addressing land issues in Kenya, has proven challenging. The report on the Dogo Commission, I would say that in terms of implementation, I think a lot of that has been done. But there are still a few untouchable areas where what the Commission recommended was not done. There's a Giuliani song, Commission of Inquiry on Akula Commission Bilakutupati And the problem is these commissions and these bodies that are mandated to protect innocent buyers don't do their job. In a country that, that's currently struggling in terms of our economy, I think streamlining the critical land administrative processes is so, so critical um, so that you can encourage um, investors to be able to bring in their money in this country, build their businesses, and continue to sustain their businesses. So that's one aspect. If we don't do that, then that will affect the level of development in this country. If you look at uh, how wealth has been created in this country, uh, much of it has been tied to land ownership, especially in the urban and the peri-urban areas, where land appreciation, when opportunities are created when corridors of corruption are opened, uh, most likely they're going to target land. It's simple, it's quick, it doesn't require education and certificates. Addressing the land question is like committing political suicide for the future. You commit suicide knowing very well that, of course, it's going to give birth to a new and a better uh, 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 society. And by political suicide, you have to say, you are going to hurt many powerful individuals. 
because it means um, hurting even yourself if you are a political leader in this country because you'll be certainly associated with the question of political power. If any arm of government, including the hallowed judiciary, go beyond the law, go beyond the constitution, there is a mechanism for necessary corrective measures that can be done. For us to be a country built on the firm foundation of the rule of law, we must always keep to that narrow path of the rule of law and avoid extra constitutional, extra legal means of dealing with one another. The scars of past injustices, a present marred by corruption and a lack of accountability, significantly hinder the prospect of attaining a fair and equitable resolution. Today, the future of land ownership in Kenya hangs in the balance, and the call for reform echoes not just in courtrooms, but in the collective conscience of a nation grappling with the shadows of its past and the pressing need for a just and equitable future. If it, this system continues the way it is going, uh, I, see, I foresee two things happening in our land. One, I see God intervening. That is the first hope, God intervening. And if God does not intervene, we are going to have rebellion in this country. Because people will reach somewhere they cannot take it anymore. Where the property rights system is broken, then you have anarchy. Um, and where you have anarchy, then it means that you cannot have a country. So it is important that uh, the policy makers, the politicians and so on and so forth, get to hear this, that um, the basis of the country is really on those property rights. As an ordinary citizen, I don't know, do we invest in this country? Do we not invest in this country? I'm born in Kenya. My parents are born in Kenya. I don't know any different. Where do I run to? Deep down inside myself, I count myself as Kenyan, but yet this is the country that still didn't support me. For Kenyans, uh, the ministry and the government at large is looking at their concerns. I know this should come from my CS, that the ministry seriously looks at their concerns and addresses each, each issue whenever it comes. We have to be able to show that the Kenyans can sleep in their homes and know their properties are safe and secure. There needs to be a, a holy alliance of the Ministry of Lands, the Land Commission, the Judiciary, EACC, and the National Police Service. If these organs work together, I don't think anybody can actually get away with the, these irregularities that we speak about every day. Kenyans will have to help themselves. If you elect crooks, they'll steal your land. So I don't think the current regime is going to fix the land problem because there's a lot of people who have benefited from public land in that regime. But eventually, maybe our kids will have to solve that problem because it has to be solved. Land grabbing is a deeply rooted problem that is all too familiar to Kenyans. This act of forcefully or illegally seizing someone's property has led to the displacement and destruction of property and livelihoods, leaving many landless and frustrated. In the course of our publishing of this investigation, we have received numerous cases of alleged land fraud and injustice relating to every institution named in this and prior episodes. While we cannot report on every case, it is our intention to carry on investigating land-related fraud. If you know of an issue that you believe meets the threshold for an investigation, please write to us at pigafirimbi at africaancensored.net and we will do our best to get back to you. Be patient as you do so. Thank you for watching.